They take him off to Barnet General Hospital for food poisoning or something. Nobody's got a very clear idea about that. He gets worse and worse and worse. Two weeks later, they ship him off to University College London with an armed guard. They'd start getting a bit suspicious at this point. They were coming down to the idea of thallium poisoning. It's a fairly available material. And they weren't finding the cause. He was getting ill and iller. And the radiation protection advisor said, what about radioactivity? Welcome to My Nuclear Life. I'm Shelley Lesher. Today on the show, we have Pete Burgess. He has a master's degree in radiobiology from London University and has spent the last 45 years in the radiation field. He has worked for governmental agencies and industry in a variety of very impressive roles around the design, evaluation, manufacture, calibration, and use of radiation monitoring equipment. He has been involved in everything from decommissioning buildings to reviewing the waste assessment process associated with the cleaning of the Chernobyl site. Pete has an impressive knowledge of everything to do with radiation. And on this episode, we discuss Alexander Levinenko. For those of you too young to remember the headlines, he was a Russian spy who defected to the United Kingdom. On November 1st, 2006, he suddenly fell ill, and it was eventually discovered that he was poisoned using polonium-210. While lying in the hospital dying, he allowed scientists to study the effects of the radiation on his body and continued to speak out against Russian President Vladimir Putin, accusing him of orchestrating the murder, which Putin categorically denied. The story has again made headlines. In September, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Russia was responsible for the murder. While everyone knew that was the case, it was only ruled as probable by the British government. Therefore, this statement made by the Human Rights Court is the first time Russian has been named responsible for the crime. About a week later, the British ITV announced David Tennant will play Alexander Levinenko in an upcoming miniseries. I really hope that makes it to the U.S. Just a quick note before we begin. This month is our one-year anniversary. Thank you for all of your support. To celebrate, we are having a drawing for some great prizes. Listen to our previous bonus episode or visit our webpage at MyNuclearLife.com for more information. The first question I want to ask you is, who is Alexander Litvinenko? Oh, well, it's well, Litvinenko. There's a word in, in the English used commonly in Britain and possibly the USA called hood, which means a representative of the security services. And he was a lieutenant colonel in the FSB, which is the successor to the much unloved KGB. And he decided he wasn't, who was he? He was, to, he was told he had to murder someone. And he decided he didn't want uh, Boris Berezovsky, who is a very prominent person in Britain to this day. He was told to murder Boris Berezovsky, and he said no. And he called the press conference, which I think the phrase brave or unwise or suicidal could be applied. was actually standing up in public and, and saying that. He was a marked man from the word go then at that point. And what year was this? God, I can't remember. It's quite a long time ago. Was the whole thing happened in 2006. And it was a few years before that. He'd been in England for a few years and in Britain for a few years. And he, he didn't have any obvious security cover because he'd been deemed, I think the inquiry said, he wasn't deemed particularly vulnerable. But most people who do what he does, we have the various high-profile high defectors all the way back to the 1940s on the nuclear side of it. They tended to say the bit, get debriefed, and just vanish. They became someone else. This is the standard way of doing this thing. New job, new, new budgetary guard, new, new name, because they've clearly upset a powerful, authoritarian, ruthless regime. And so what do they expect to happen, in all honesty? But Livinenko wasn't 
given this new identity or had gone underground? No, he, he wasn't underground at all. He was up in the public domain. He was in the newspaper. He went to see all the various oligarchs. Was a lot of the Russian people who made obscene amounts of money from uh, buying into the share issue that came with the collapse of communism, where you've got shares and they bought them up and are worth billions. A lot of them live in the UK and London. And he kept mixing in exactly that, that scene. And he was obviously in some sort of project with the two guys that murdered him because he'd met them several times. He knew them well enough to go drinking with them, but he didn't drink, which was the interesting thing about Litvinenko. He was teetotal. But he knew them well enough to meet up with them, always in public places anyway, admittedly, but regularly. And so that's why someone would want to murder him. Yeah, I think so, because basically he'd written a rather, at least one, not very exciting, but amazingly embarrassing book. So he'd even gone further in the press conference than talking to the press. He'd actually written a book about it. And he was continuing his involvement at this level with people who Vladimir Putin would see as enemies, those people, the, the what's the word for it, the Russian word, oligarchs who'd legged it with lots of money. Putin worries about them because they obviously have power and influence, and he was continuing to deal with them. He wasn't at all low profile. And I just uh, want to ask you, what is your job or what is your connection to this case? Ah, right. OK, this is a bit interesting. I, I'm basically an instrument techie from the dawn of time. I worked for the UK's National Radiological Protection Board, which was a wonderful government-funded organisation, which turned into the Health Protection Agency, who dealt with most of the public domain things to do with Litvinenko, which has now turned into Public Health England, which obviously got involved, PHE involved in the COVID-19 problem and has turned into something else again. And I went from there to the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority to help them knock it down. And then I went to the National Physical Laboratory as head of science for a part of our National Standards Lab. And I, I went to work for a red in tooth and clock contractor. And then for a few years, and then a friend of mine made me the offer to start concert to employ me directly. And so basically I've taken an interest in radiation measurement, radiation detection, but I've always gone a bit outside it. So we did a lot to do with nuclear accidents because it was my old group who actually managed the surveying during the Litvinenko event. If it happened a few years before, it would have been me, but it was my successor who managed the surveying, sending people out to do measurements on things, detection, etc. I don't think people understand the resources that it takes to investigate something like this when it happens. It's, they are huge, and because they cover all the way from the public to the security services, there's lots of different people involved. The interfacing is terrible. So I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, because I know the story and our listeners may not, but I think we should stress that you are only talking about information that is available in the public domain and you are not talking about any sort of secrets or state secrets? The reason the PowerPoint presentation I sent you exists is my boss at the National Physical Laboratory, I had a department, we used to have a regular monthly communication thing, which was quite nice because we had it in the staff club and you could have beer and a snack with it and things like that, very civilised. And he said, can you do one on Litvinenko? And I went, I suppose so. And I was just asked to look into it. And at that point, I obviously could have asked people in discreet questions. Now, they wouldn't have answered them, probably. The usual question is, it's from something, or would the question be indiscreet? No, the answer might be, as always, the smart reply. And so I looked at, at but that point it was going on. So there was obviously the BBC website and the Health Protection Agency website and various other decent newspapers and things like that. There's plenty of information flying around. And because it's electronic, a lot of it can still be found. Most of the daily BBC bulletins and things are still available if you know where to find, if you look for them. So it was quite easy to put together an authoritative public presentation, at least as far as the consequences of the accident for the UK public are concerned. It gets a lot more shaky when you get to Litvinenko himself, obviously, because that was handled by 
on the secure side of the business, but mostly the, the, the radiation side of it was handled by the atomic weapons establishment at Aldermarsen, which is our equivalent of Los Alamos, basically. So they are obviously a secure organization because they make nuclear weapons. And so they have that structure in there and links. And they are the radiation protection advisors, which in the UK is a formal position to the Home Office, which is, what do you call them? State Department, I suppose, would be that the equivalent. So they are, so they are, they're involved. Well, I'm really glad that you have this comprehensive knowledge about what happened, so that I can I can talk to you about it. What happened in 2006? So, what did Alexander Livinenko know? What happened to him, or how did he present? What kind of started? Oh, right. We'll go through the history. I made a few notes. So he went off to see to see Lugovay and Kovchin. Uh, the other in November the 1st in the Pine Bar in the Millennium Hotel. What was faintly interesting is when we had the big presentation about the process, it was actually done in the Millennium Hotel. It was quite interesting. It was quite bizarre, really. The same place. Was that done on purpose? I don't know, but the manager said he'd make it very clear that anyone found being unkind would be found tied to the railings outside for the amusement that passes <laughs> by. See, so he, 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 then he went off to see Mario Scaramella at the Itsu Sushi Bar. Now, there is strong basis for this was not the first attempt to kill him. It appears that they turned up early on October the 16th. This is not coming out terribly officially, but it's one of those investigative reporter things who's got a very good reputation. And they put it in his tea, but he didn't drink it. And another time they turned up, they it threw it down the toilet for some reason. They couldn't administer it. So this seems to be the third go. And there was a bit of suspicion always, and it's not clear from the public thing whether he was actually killed, whether he was actually poisoned in the Millennium Hotel or the su- Itsu Sushi Bar. But we'll go for the Millennium Hotel at the moment. That was November the 1st. And he feels a bit rough that evening. November the 4th, he's really ill. They take him off to Barnet General Hospital, which is a big public hospital in the north of London. It's a very good hospital for food poisoning or something. Nobody's got a very clear idea about that. He gets worse and worse and worse. Two weeks later, they ship him off to University College London, which is the real centre of excellence in the UK from medicine. They were with an armed guard. They'd started getting a bit suspicious at this point. A couple of days later, somebody was they were coming down the idea of thallium poisoning because thallium has been over the years a fairly popular poison because it's a fairly available material. And it had the it makes you feel ill or your hair falls out and things. So you had all the right symptoms for thallium poisoning. But somebody had a suspicion, the radiation protection advisor thought they should look for the presence of radioactivity. Because it just wasn't hanging together. They weren't finding the thallium, they weren't finding the cause. He was getting ill and ill. And the radiation protection advisor said, what about radioactivity? Barnet Hospital had already thought about that and they'd waved a monitor over him, but he didn't come up as radioactive, which is quite believable in the early stages. So they did it and they presumably took a blood or probably urine sample, which is the easy one, and they found polonium-210 in it. It's quite distinctive material. By that point, he was in a terrible state. He was in intensive care the day after. The counter-terrorism people got involved. And he had a heart attack on the 22nd. He was dead on the 23rd. So it took him, what's that, just over three weeks to die. That's not very long. It's a horrible way to go. That's one of the things about it. You basically, what happens is your liver dies and your kidneys deteriorate. And so you fill up with waste products. Your bloodstream fills up with waste products. It's a really unpleasant way to go. So what is the difference between thallium and polonium? Well, they're very close together in the periodic table, which is interesting. But polonium, it's thallium. Is it? Th- I can't remember what the order is, but it's lead, the thallium, lead, bismuth, and I think it's polonium next. I can't remember. It's on the wall behind. If what you poison people with thallium, you poison them with the stable isotope, whereas polonium has no stable isotopes. Because bismuth is the highest atomic number that has at least apparently stable isotopes. Beyond that, everything's radioactive. But it's relatively easy to make. 
And is there a kind of antidote for thallium poisoning? You can use, let's think, it's ED, I'll see if I can get this right, EDTA, which is a chelating agent. No, for thallium poisoning, yeah, you can use all these things. You, you use a chelating agent, which binds to the metal atom and then helps it to be excreted and you can reduce the body concentration a bit if you start early. Medics use it all the time, but I can't remember what they use it for. But it's a routinely used treatment for heavy metals and the like. Is there anything that can be done if you get polonium poisoning? The same thing will work to a degree. But the, one of the problems about polonium is it's very transmissible across the gut, which is one of the things that makes it a good poison. Because lots of alpha emitters don't go across the gut at all. Plutonium, as these big atoms, don't travel across the gut into the bloodstream particularly well. But polonium is unusually soluble. Work on the basis of something like a third or a quarter will go across, which is very high. Most things go on one end and come out the other by natural process. And so it gets into the bloodstream and then it gets concentrated in um, liver and kidneys. It's a soft tissue one. Because a lot of the other things are, are bone seekers. Plutonium is a bone seeker, as is radium itself, because they're calcium analogs. But this stuff goes into soft tissue, which is quite unusual. It's got a reasonable biological half-life. It's not cleared from the body particularly well either. So we're talking about polonium-210 yeah. is what they use. Yeah. Is this hard to get? There's a lot of things. I disagree with the guy who did the analysis of where it came from. Now, it seems that the stuff is reactor produced. This is the hypothesis. You take bismuth 209 and you hit it with a neutron and it turns into bismuth 210, which then emits a beta particle, which turns into polonium 210. That step that works quite quickly. And it's a routine industrial process. That's the attraction of polonium. It's a, it was at one point used in quantity, it is still used to a degree. And it's a standard industrial radionuclide because it was originally used, the main interest in polonium-210 was as a starter for nuclear weapons. The first starter had polonium-210 derived from radium mixed with beryllium, and when you detonated the conventional explosive, it squeezed the core, which mixed the polonium and the beryllium, which then emitted, not very efficiently, but efficiently enough, neutrons to start the nuclear detonation. So it was used for that but it was used for years as anti-static bars. If you ask your mum or dad or even your grandfather, when they had rec big plastic vinyl discs, you could get a little brush, which had polonium-210 in it, which generated the high level of ionization, which would stop the little bits of fluff and cat hairs and things climbing onto your vinyl disc when you hold it out of the bag. And it's also used for, um, when you, at one point it was very popular if you, use, if you sprayed things because you don't want bits of fluff sticking on your recently restored Cadillac. And you'd irradiate it, and you'd put one of these polonium anti-static bars near it, which generated a, a huge cloud of ions, which would then neutralize any surface charge effect. But using it on your vinyl or using it on your Cadillac, that's not in concentrations that are... Uh, not, not in the quantities uh, it would make any sense. Poisonous. No, people hypothesize that people had collected 7 million anti-static brushes and boiled them up and collected it all and stuff. But you know, that's just, it would be thousands you'd need to do to kill someone. So what kind of concentration do you need or what is the activity that's needed or the amount that's needed of polonium-210 to actually be effective in killing someone in, in three weeks? Gigabecquerels, several gigabecquerels, three to 10, that sort of number. Sounds a lot. For American listeners, that's approximately one curie. <laughs> one curie is a lot. Yeah, I mean, but it's a lot I of teach, activity, I, but it's no mass. Yeah. It's, it's tens, it's maybe 50 or 100 micrograms that they used. That's all. It's got a very, very high specific activity. That's one of the attractions of polonium-210 as a poison. Because it's got a short half-life, you don't need very much mass. But where would you get micrograms of polonium-210? Where did they get that in the, in the UK? Or were they able to smuggle it in from Russia? No, they brought it in from Russia because we know for a fact that people thought these people were very professional but in radioactivity terms, there were a bunch of amateurs. They had not, either the product wasn't very good or they hadn't been properly briefed. Because what you do, and I worked 
I've worked for this. You, you make anything you want in a little glass file on a tube, and then you spin it gently and you heat it up with a torch and pinch it off. So you've now got a flame sealed glass file. You then wash that in nitric acid and to all intents and purposes, that is then clean. And then if you're of a nervous disposition or any, you have any sense at all, you put it inside something else and the something else has enough absorber in there to soak it up if you break it, if you drop a big weight on it or something like that, it won't be dispersed. And then you wash that off with nitric acid and you can go anywhere you want. You will have nothing on your hands at all. But they left a trail of stuff. The security people knew very early on who it was. The people who did the surveying were taken to specific seats, specific in aircraft. Interesting thing, aircraft seats get washed regularly, changed, and so they had to go and chase the aircraft. But they found the aircraft seats. They were obviously contaminated. They went to the Emirates Stadium, which is a vast football stadium, and looked on specific seats. So it wasn't the radiation that led the security people. Security people were getting their suspicions confirmed as they went through the process. So they figured out who the the men were that poisoned Livinenko, and then they, they backtraced them to figure out where the, the polonium came from. That's it. Well, they, they, knew, they knew it came in from a flight from Moscow. So my question is, when I go to the airport, they will test my hands sometimes. And it's a little concerning that they were able to bring in this much radioactivity on a flight into Britain. Now, here is a quiz for your people. Ask them to choose a suitable radionuclide as a poison. So let's go through this. I'm sure it makes sense. Right. Okay. Let's see how I do. Okay. It's got to be poisonous anyway in some way. It's, so you've got to be able to administer it. So you want a small quantity because obviously it's good. The administration has got to be discreet. So that implies it's got to have a short half-life because of the uh, activity atoms correspondence. So we've got a short half-life material. You want it to be aggressive. It has a lot of energy per decay, which is what you're looking for. And so you want something that generates MEV per decay. There's no point trying to poison people with tritium because it generates KEV. So you need to, because you need to deposit energy in there to produce those, i.e. joules per kilogram to kill the organ or damage the organ. You don't want it to be easily detectable. So you don't want it to emit gamma radiation because as you walk through airports and past uh, customs barriers and the like, quite often there's a big gray panel on each side of you and there's a very suspicious person looking at, looking at the result of the said gray panel. So if you set off, uh, if you were a significant gamma emitter, then that will set it off. If you look at an energetic beta emitter, which might also be attractive, because you get MEV and you get the appropriate half-life, you get Bremsstrahlung a breaking radiation, which is how a normal X-ray set works. Not very effective, but a percent or two of the radiation will get turned into photons and will also trigger one of these detectors. So you don't want a beta emitter. You want an alpha emitter which doesn't emit gammas in any sense. Some of them do. Americium-241, for example, which is the very popular one in smoke detectors, emits a 60 keV gamma. And that would make it very, at these quantities, very easy to detect, so you don't want that. And so we've got short half-life, alpha emitter, no gammas, and also those things you have to worry not only about the top decay, but you have to worry about decay down the chain, because many of these nuclides are the head of a decay stage or two. So you might find the top one doesn't emit the gammas, but the next one does. So you need this end of the line, at least as far as significant radiation is concerned, emitter. You want it to be easy to make. And so you've led inevitably pretty well. We spent a lot of time over the tea room you know, trying to think of something else. And it's the sort of thing, you know, what could, oh, what about this? No, that, oh, no, that won't work, will it? And, and so you go through the process and you get pushed. Polonium-210 is, is pretty the darn good. And then, of course, polonium-210 decays by alpha to lead-206, which is stable. So, I mean, it's it's a good poison. It, it admits there is a small, this the quantity you're talking about, there is always a gamma line of some sort in this one. This is the very old book, and it's, does it have it in here? No, it doesn't quote the gammas in here. But it's 0. 0.0 something, 0. 0 something percent. But when you multiply it by 10 to the power of 10, 
you still end up with quite a lot of photons. And I think I worked it out. It's something like what they brought in was about 20 kilobecquerels of gamma emitter. So you would have to be careful when you brought in. It's something that's on the edge of detectability. Do you think they knew exactly what they were bringing in? They didn't, but somebody did. Okay. They were given this stuff, pour it in this dude's tea, don't get it on your hands. What equivalent? That probably looks like that was about, this stuff is very toxic, do not get it in your hands, pour it in his tea. So it's possible that as they were coming through the airport, they didn't even realize it was a radionuclide, but they just thought it was a poison. Yeah, possibly. But why? Because the argument is why tell people and make them nervous? And that, that would be my slightly uh, Machiavellian thing. What benefit is them to know it's radioactive? Right. Especially because, you know, as soon as you say radioactivity, then people freak out. They probably would have shown that as they were interacting with him or interacting with the poison. And maybe wouldn't have done a good job. Yeah, that would have made them a bit nervous because you know, you'll know as well as I do that the, the, word, the concept of radioactivity is something that bothers even people who are prepared to kill other people so, from their own personal point of view. So that leads to the question that they could have used just a regular poison, right? Why choose this kind of horrible way to die? Or was it that reason? That it's a horrible way to die. It seems to be it's a horrible way to die. Because various people have been off with thallium. And, of course, we had Georgi Markov, who was killed off with, with ricin. So there's been a, a, a plentiful history of people being killed by, by poison. They could have used thallium. Thallium's it's not as toxic as polonium-210, but it's extraordinarily toxic material. So the, the hypothesis is that we're making some sort of point, either technical ability, possibly, Although I just wanted to be really unpleasant about the whole thing, which I, I lean towards that. One of the things you can do, which is never talked about, is you can make this stuff from old radium-226 gamma sources. This is public domain stuff. If you dissolve radium-226, what people did back in the 1930s, 40s, up to the 50s, people made radiotherapy sources that used significant quantities of radium-226, if you remember the, the Marie Curie history. And they were made in little platinum containers. And so people have a tendency to recycle the platinum by taking these sources, decanning them, pouring the radium out, cleaning it out a bit. So you'll find people who work with scrap platinum always come with a radiation monitor. Now, when you remove the radium, if you look at the half-lives of the various components, all there is in radium in terms of mass is the radium originally, the lead, which has grown in over its years, and the only other thing in there is the polonium-210 because it's 164-day half-life. Now, polonium has a very interesting chemistry. It sticks like mad to metals. So if you dissolve the radium, you drop a piece of silver into it, Give it a little shake, all the polonium sticks to the metal, and you can then strip it off. And there are hundreds of radium sources in source stores all over the world. Thousands, probably. Significant active, this sort of activity as well. Couldn't they tell if this is the way it was produced or if it was reactor produced? Well, I think that's the difference. They're not seeing why. But obviously, when you put anything in a reactor and irradiate with neutrons, then if there's anything in there with any sort of capture cross-section or something like that, it will become activated. Now, they're very insistent that this is reactor produced. So the argument is they will have found other radionuclides in there, which tells them it's reactor produced. And it's not part of the radium decay chain, which is why this other idea is probably not the case. But it's possible that it could happen. Yeah. And it would widen the, it would widen the ability to do it because this, every country has a, has a big locked thing full of radium. That they don't know what to do with it. So now you've just scared a lot more people. <laughs> well, <okay. laughs> possibly. I mean, I, I kind of dismiss the argument of showing their expertise because I think even in 2000, I mean, especially by 2006, I think the world understood that the Russians were pretty good at nuclear physics. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, I mean, there was no doubt that they knew what they were doing as far as nuclear physics was concerned. I don't, I don't know. It's, nobody's ever come up with a really definitive statement. As far as we know, as far as Wikipedia knows as well, there is no sign, well, there was one possible attempt later, 
but certainly it hasn't been used more than perhaps twice over the years. I mean, it is a very strong statement, right? Because it's hard to detect. So it did take them a while to even figure out what it was. And by that time, presumably it was too late to even help him. Oh, yeah, well and truly. Well, it was probably too late to help him after uh, about an hour after it was administered because it does go across the barrier, the stomach barrier quickly. Did the Russians use poison frequently to kill dissidents? I think the answer, yes, there, there, are, there are cases. Well, we know, we know they did the Salisbury poisoning as well. Again, that was a, a renegade hood, if we want to use the, the slightly, uh, I don't know what you call it, term anyway, colloquial term. So they had a go at killing him and his daughter, I think it was, and nearly succeeded. So, and that's when obviously the Bulgarians probably, well, it, is, it is allegedly, there's a phrase that gets you out of every, every court of law, because I heard someone allegedly killed Georgie Markov with ricin. I want to go back to how it was detected. And there is a nuclear forensics team in, in most countries. And it was this nuclear forensics team that went out to figure out where the poison was administered and what was impacted and who was exposed to this. Yeah, that's right. There was because you obviously have the what was it and where was it done and then and how much and all that. And then you have the bit who else did it affect. It took them a while to figure out that it was radiation poisoning. So how long did it take them to kind of retrace his steps? That was quite quick. I don't, I don't I haven't got the exact timing, but the, it was it was coherent enough that they could find out where he'd been. And they find out very quickly. Because the problem, but one of the really fascinating things about polonium-10, and it is a weakness, if you want to call it as a poison, is that it's got quite a significant melting point, but it seems to disperse in an aerosol at quite low temperatures for reasons that people are never quite sure about. Whether it's a sort of alpha recoil process where they, they, you lose a lump of it, but, but it comes out in sweat and breath really quite effectively. And so if somebody said to me, has this person been poisoned with polonium-210? I'd ask them to give them a clean spoon and get them to do that to it. And then I'd check the spoon. There's sufficient- Okay, and the listeners can't see, but it was rubbing their hands on That's the spoon. It. You, rub, you rub your hands. So, and it comes off because we had one case, I know that it was a door plate in a, not an enormously traffic building, but the building where maybe a hundred people went in now every day. When there's this brass plate on the door, and two weeks later, it was still obviously radioactive. He must have touched, probably touched it once. And it was very clearly radioactive. So it does disperse easily on any object or surface. Obviously, to get detect alphas, you need a decent surface. Well, the efficiency is very poor. You can detect it on tiles, for example, but it's, they've got to be rather, rather radioactive. But things like metal plates or um, plastic laminates or anything like that, it's quite easy to find. So I'm guessing the people that were most in danger were his family members because he spent the most time with them. Yeah, because Mrs. Litvinenko was obviously contaminated. There was contamination in his house very clearly. But she was not contaminated to a point which was regarded as life-threatening in the short term. Because, you know, with radiation, you get acute and long-term effects. But it would obviously be a significant committed dose in REM for, or sievers, which will have long-term implications for her health, inevitably. There is a calculable probability that she will die as a consequence of a radiation-induced cancer, for example. But it's relatively small. And I, I want to point out that one of the things with alpha emitters is that you really have to ingest them for them to be really dangerous to your health. That's it. It's, so you, because they've got the range, of, uh, the range of an alpha emitter in tissue is microns. In here, it's technically about 30 to 40 millimetres in air. But obviously, when you go into tissue, just simply because of change of density, there's a factor of 800 deduction in that. So it's 40 millimetres divided by 800. So let's call it 50 microns, why not? As far as an alpha goes in tissue. And it's the same if you have a surface which is in the least bit greasy, you cannot trust it for monitoring. And the standard approach is when you go into the, into the cafeteria or whatever you happen to call it, and you get a plate up, and it's just got that little sheen of grease on it, and have another one. 
we were all students for far too long. Went, eh, don't I think so, yeah. It's, it's that point where it's got that just that, at that point, the alphas don't go through it. Oh, so you're saying that they're doing us a favor by serving us greasy food. No, no, not really. Not unless no? they're also <laughs> serving you on radioactively contaminated plates. But even then... Which they could be if they're using old 1950s dinnerware. That's it. Yes, what's it called? Fiesta wear, if it's bright orange. Yes, old good. fiesta wear. Yeah, very good. So I heard that the most contaminated part of the city was Livinenko's toilet. Yeah, yeah. To be slightly vulgar, lose used by Litvinenko a convincing proof that gentlemen cannot aim very effectively. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. You might want to edit that bit out. But yeah. No, um, no, I like it because I think that every woman listening to this, it just proves that we're right. Well, that's possibly something that wasn't originally in the public domain, but somebody who used to work for me was deeply involved in it. She looked at me and said, I keep telling gentlemen they can't aim. I went, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Don't give me a hard time. Um, and so, now, that is that is staying in because it just it reaffirms what we've always said, that men's restrooms are disgusting. And exactly I think that. that just proves it. And, of course, it's it's removed via the kidneys and feces, the urine and feces. So, so Expelled. It's, it's I always expelled, say it's right. expelled in ways Ex- that excre- you would expect it. Excreted. Excreted. So, that's, that's it. it. So that's you would, the yes, you will, find, you will find the loose, but also probably the loose handle and things that, and the door handle and things like that. So, I mean, could they tell then how well he washed his hands? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's an interesting thought. No, I don't know about that. But what is important for people listening to this is obviously of the people potentially exposed. He was in Barnet Hospital for for days. How long was he there for? He was in Barnet Hospital for nearly two weeks when he would have been intense, as intensely radioactive as he's ever been, because obviously it was being it was being excreted all the time. And when they looked for it, they found that with the people who looked after him, they found no trace of it and realized that normal medical standards of hygiene were enough to make it almost undetectable. Oh. So I don't know if you can answer this, but when you go back to the Chernobyl accident. I don't know if you've seen the HBO miniseries. It's very good. I haven't got to the end one yet, but basically it's pretty good because I was involved in it. Oh, well, so this brings the question of how well that was portrayed as far as hospital workers dealing with the firemen that came in. And was it a huge concern about them interacting with the patients in the hospital? Because you just said in in the hospital in the UK, there wasn't this transference of of radiation. Do you think Chernobyl would have been different? Yes, because the firemen weren't that contaminated. The fire dress was contaminated. They were hit mostly by the gamma radiation when they were there. So were they radioactive when they were in the hospital? The firemen, not to any significant degree, no. There would have been a little bit of neutrons which would have activated them. They would have ingested some inevitably because the fire dress and fire dress procedure wasn't very good. It wasn't up to Western standards even of the time. And so they would have had hand and surface contamination perhaps around the fa- where the face mask went round and things like that. It depends whether they had BA on breathing apparatus. If they had breathing apparatus on, that would have protected the lungs pretty well. If not, then they would have ingested some. But I do not think that they would have been difficult to treat because of the radioactivity on the Chernobyl farm. And people nowadays would pay attention to it, but they wouldn't be that bothered. So they would have died because of their exposure to radiation, but they wouldn't have killed people because of being radioactive. That's exactly it. The one or two people who did things like pick up pieces of reactor graphite, but of course the hand just disintegrated really quickly because it just killed the tissue with death. And so, you know, the problem for the firemen was external gamma exposure. Yeah. Or, of course, the people who actually touched the clothing that they wore. It would have been a bit bit come off on them. But the usual handlers, you know, if you look at the transfer factor, it's part of the thing in radiation detection. There's always the argument is how much comes off this surface. And it's always percent depends how deliberately you, you do it. But there's plenty of history. One of the things people do when you're looking at radioactivity in an area is you worry about radioactivity, which is resuspendable or ingestible in some way, i.e. which will come off a surface. And you take wipes all the time. And obviously, you don't 
pick up everything which is there. And the standard number is 10% as uh, an efficiency, which is nervous. Normally, if you do it carefully on a good surface, you get more like 30%. But you don't get much above that. And those are surfaces such as stainless steel bench tops and things where you might imagine it would be easy, relatively easy to pick things up. So the, re the, the transfer factor, everything acts as dilutant. So at the end of the day, you've then got it on your hands. Radioactivity on your hands isn't a big deal, provided it's not going to damage your skin. You can have hundreds of becquerels per square centimetre on your hand with very little consequence. It's whether it gets up your nose particularly or into your gut. So you have another transferring process, which is why if you're hiring people for use to work in radiation areas, you always look at the fingernails. Oh, to make sure they're clean? No, to make sure they don't do that. Oh, to make sure they don't bite their and you nails. And make sure you do try and avoid people who do this and worry about okay. who are Touch always their touching faces. their face and rubbing their noses and things like that. It's the same as COVID-19. That's one of the interesting things, that radiation people are intrinsically COVID-19 resistant because if you deal with unsealed radioactivity, we all get in the habit of not putting our hands near our faces, just intrinsically. Yeah. Because we get shouted yeah. at it if we do. Yeah. So that was a good tie back to one of the, the other episodes and something that people always ask me about after watching the HBO miniseries because they, they really play up the fact that, you know, hospital workers are dying because of the firemen and that one of the women, you know, her baby dies because of the, the radiation exposure. Yeah, indeed. So it's always the problem as well is one of the problems with looking at the consequences of the Chernobyl accident was a relatively poor medical standard. So you have no baseline. When you're doing epidemiology, it's not whether you get it, it's how much more have you got. And as soon as you start looking, you find. If you don't look, you don't find. People die of pneumonia all the time, which is in fact, we used to be, people used to be, the death certificate would say pneumonia, whereas in fact it was cancer really that killed them, but they hadn't detected that. So the obvious cause of death was pneumonia. So when you start having the capacity to look for cancers, you will find them. And so you need this background rate. And life in the Ukraine was quite tough. And people did tend to smoke and drink a bit too much. Yeah. So back to our story. I mean, I think that Livinenko was poisoned with a radioactive substance came out in the news quite quickly. How were the public fears managed? Or were they managed well? Yeah, they were. It was fascinating. It was really, really interesting. Because I think it was, again, it was the University College. Some part of London University went out and they did a survey. And the standard reaction was, if you hadn't been to the sushi bar and you hadn't been to the Millennium Hotel, then the action was, it was deemed to be a hit in the mafia tradition. You know, the guy was targeted, he was taken out. There's a little bit of fallout around the edge. That's it. People were not that bothered, actually. Quite, it, was, it was very interesting. It was one of the more surprising conclusions that people saw it as a gangland killing for example, with not very much different to shooting someone down in, in, in a casino somewhere or anything like that. Okay, that is very surprising because you'd think that, you know, radiation, terrorists, like they're all coming to get us, but that wasn't the response. I did. The, the interesting thing was to see each radiation accident or incident in the UK has had its own characteristic smell. Well, no, I don't know. It is really because during the the, uh, the wind scale fire in the 1950s, 1957, what people were looking at mostly was radioactivity on green vegetables, which you could absorb. And to measure the radioactivity, one of the first things you tend to do is ash things to reduce, remove the water content, reduce the volume, concentrate it. And so the world smelt of burning cabbage. No, sorry, no, I've got that wrong. That was Chernobyl, the world smelt of burning cabbage. For the wind scale fire, it was burning milk because they're worried about iodine in milk. So they're always ashing, reducing milk. Okay, burning cabbage, burning milk. What was, what's the next one? Boiling urine. <laughs> because, Wait, which, which one is this? Which one's boiling urine? Litvinenko. Because people, people who thought they were exposed were asked to produce a urine sample. 
And so the world was full, not exactly full of people wandering around with carrier bags. It went slosh, slosh, faint liter. And you wanted a liter or two liters, quite a lot of it, because to the minimum detectable activity is millibecquerels or something like that. So you want quite a lot of, a lot of you. But it's a standard process because one of the interesting things to do with is that polonium-210 is a recognized environmental pollutant. It's obviously there from the radium decay chain. It's also very prominent in the, the tobacco has the capacity, the tobacco plant has the capacity for concentrating polonium. And so people who smoke have significant quantities of polonium-210 of the order millibecquerels per day in the urine. Yeah, so if there wasn't enough reasons to quit smoking... That's, I think that's, that's, a, that's another that's one. That's another yeah, one. It's, radio, it's radioactive indeed. But the, the main concern seemed to be from people who'd phoned with British Airways and potentially on the same aircraft and things like that. Because they, they set up a helpline and they got a lot of inquiries from people who were concerned about having been on the same aircraft. Well, and especially people who had, I mean, I'm sure people who sat in the same seats yeah, were exactly. concerned. That's it. And lots of people were tested. And there were uh, the people who showed up, they found trace quantities in the Itsu sushi bar stuff. But the question is, it went into a teapot, fair enough. Who caught the teapot afterwards? Did they ever find out? No. Nope. Well, it's never been seen. Maybe they did, but it's never been admitted to. And again, we, we're going through this process. You know, and my, my lady actually did some downstairs. She actually did some of the assessments on this. And she admitted today that she'd actually made tea. She'd weighed the teapot fairly accurately. She'd weighed tea and then she'd sort of finished tea and she'd weighed it again. And then she'd washed it out a bit and weighed it again so to work out how much would remain actually in the teapot and then of course that would then go into the dishwasher and the chemistry I suspect of dishwashers is very aggressive. Polonium isn't very soluble in alkalis, it's soluble in acids so I think dishwashers tend to be alkalized. so how much was left on the teapot and how much wasn't stuck because if it's stuck to the walls then it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant and inside the teapot, it's not doing anyone any harm, provided it doesn't go back into solution. So you have this tremendous dilution effect all the time. And so it would be easy to get 10 to the 6 dilution quite easily. That's not enough, 10 to 4, 10 to 6, which means it would be a measurable quantity you ingested, perhaps, but not life-threatening in any sense. So the person, even if there was a little bit of leaching from the sides, probably was okay. Yeah, it would be. They would certainly, they might have had detectable activity, but on the other hand, it would never have been life threatening. So is there a fear that polonium-210 could be used in a terrorist attack? You need significant quantities in terms of activity to produce direct ill health and death. You need to administer it in a fairly focused way, which is why the teapot, of course, is a brilliant way of doing it, in all honesty. So it's not something that you could put in a water supply, for example, a city water supply or anything like that. That just wouldn't make sense. It would be perhaps the method of choice for a rather more targeted attack. You could, I suppose, make rather a lot of it and dump it into some institution's water supply, but you'd have to be able to get it in there. And you look at the amount of water that if you put it into an institution's water supply, how much of that water is actually ever drunk? Tiny percentage is actually drunk. And so it would be difficult, I think, to actually do any damage with that. And it just wouldn't be worth the effort, in all honesty. But there was, obviously, I suspect, any time a prominent person who is in any sort of danger falls ill, I suspect now that if it looks like poisoning, then I suspect there will be a, a quick check because it's quite easy to do. Almost all hospitals, if they know it's there, hospitals have got a lot better about alpha meters now. They didn't do alphas before, but more and more hospitals are getting into using radium-223 as a palliative therapy for bone cancer. So hospital medical physics people are getting much more confident, much more familiar with they're always very competent, but they would have had to read up on it, whereas now they can do it from nothing. And most hospitals have the capacity to count liquid samples or easily. So 
And all you've got to do is get someone to wee in a vial and you liquid sink out it and you'll be able to tell whether they've got significant radioactivity in them. Is there something that we haven't talked about that you'd like to address? One of the things I'd say to people is that when you're dealing with members of the public, what is absolutely fundamental is you don't dress up too much. Like you physically don't dress up or you don't dress up your language? No, you don't. Yeah, both, actually. You try and speak speak English, but you don't dress up too much. If it's a small radiation incident, you don't come in wearing a, wearing a full plastic suit and things like that. Okay. It was one of the best things as an advert for my old mob. When Chernobyl happened, one of the more worried groups from the UK's point of view, there was a bunch of students on exchange visit in Kiev. And we knew the plume had gone over Kiev. And they came back and they were terrified because they'd been on the edge of a very large nuclear accident. And they turned up at Heathrow, very nervous. And they were met there by our director, John Dunster, who was a super guy, who's, no, not by our director, one of the assistant directors, who the director said, we didn't turn a crisis into a drama. That was it. Mm-hmm. Met by Barry Holiday in his, uh, this, this is a long time ago, 30 odd years ago, in his gentleman's tweed jacket with his pipe. And by my good friend, Danny Blundell, in jeans, a T-shirt, a Mickey Mouse T-shirt as well, and normal shoes. But he had a pair of gloves on, and they arrived and he went, because he's from South Carolina, he went, all right, lads, line up against the wall with you, one at a time. And so when they saw Danny stand there grinning furiously with his Mickey Mouse T-shirt on, everyone, he said, you could just walk. And they looked at Barry and they just relaxed, the whole queue relaxed. But one of the most useful things we find out at Chernobyl, somebody's rope sold sandal. And we got a little piece of fuel out of it. Because at that point, nobody was saying what the fuel was, what the burnout was, and things like that. You've got a tiny fuel particle. Danny said it was blindingly obviously there. Most of them had a little bit of radioactivity on it, but the, you check the, um, check the shoes. Shoes are one of the things you always check. And they find a little piece of fuel in it, because at that point, the Russians were saying nothing. The USSR was saying nothing about it. So you found part of the Chernobyl fuel on an exchange student's shoe from that came from Kiev? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's a very small piece, but it was very obviously there. Now, I don't know. I don't know if they ever told me. I don't know. We never find out how big it was, but I suspect it was invisible. But because right. it was... I mean, it, it had to have been like sand. No, no, it would be much smaller than that. It would just... They were genuinely invisible. It would just... They, Danny said he found it quite easily. He got quite a lot of counts off it and just said, they can't take your shoes off the stuff. We I mean, just... Things like that. Just stick them in a the plastic bag. Got another pair? Yeah, well, you need to walk around until you get your baggage back. Put the other shoes on. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Pete Burgess for taking time out to talk to us. We would appreciate you rating, reviewing, or following us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, or just tell a friend to tune in. Visit our website at mynuclearlife.com for more information on how to support us, enter our anniversary drawing, send us an email, or just learn more about us. Until next time, I'm Shelley Lesher, and this has been My Nuclear Life.